Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. My dear sisters and my brothers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. These days I started receiving a lot of messages from people about the first 10 days of the Hijjah and that I should increase in my deeds, in the actions, repent to Allah because in those 10 days all the actions are overly loved by Allah that he rewards greatly because of them, all kinds of stuff. And uh, then some people would send you a hadith and other sayings of scholars. Basically what they're trying to tell us that now the first of the 10 days of the Hijjah the month of Hajj have started then we should actually uh, just go and, and go crazy on the good deeds because Allah will reward us absolutely fantastically great so much so that probably we should work just in the 10 days and then take the rest of the year uh, off okay and uh, I just want to take a moment to tell you that the first 10 days of the Hijjah have absolutely no virtues in the sight of Allah and they actually aren't the best days in the sight of Allah. That's because if you look at the evidences given and what Allah says in the Quran and also when you look at history and when you look at other things that are kept away from you you would actually come to understand that the 10 days mean absolutely nothing and that the whole thing about the 10 days of the Hijjah is actually a huge big fat lie Here is, uh, hear me out and you will see what I mean by that the first hadith that they tell you is the one in Al-Bukhari and I will just say the English part of it except the Quran to save on time. Well, they say that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said there are no days during which the righteous actions uh, are pleasing or so pleasing to Allah except those days, i.e. the first 10 days of the Hijjah. And he was asked, oh Messenger of Allah, not even the Jihad for the sake of Allah. And the Messenger is reported to have said, of course I don't believe in all this, but I'm just telling you the arguments that they use, okay? And they said that he replied, not even Al-Jihad. In the, uh, for the sake of Allah, except in one's case, if someone goes forth with his life and his property and does not return with either of them. And this is in Al-Bukhari. In another version of the arguments used these days is that not even jihad except that of a man who does it by putting himself and his property in danger for Allah's sake. Then there are other man-made hadiths that state that the Prophet of Allah وسلم, is reported to have said that there are no days more beloved to Allah th that he be rushed in them than the 10 days of the Hijjah. Fasting every day of them is the equivalent of fasting an entire year. And standing every night of them, i.e. in those 10 days of the Hijjah, is the equivalent of standing on the night of Al-Qadr. And this hadith is by a tirmidhi Ibn Majah and Al-Bazzar. This hadith, even though considered weak because of one single man in the chain of narrator, yet the sheikhs and preachers still mention that Ibn Sirin and Qatada, both of which are extremely well-respected scholars in our Sunni sphere, so to speak, they say that fasting each day from the ten equals the fasting of a whole year, i.e. you fast 10 days, you get 10 years. Then they mentioned that Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was one of the great companions, and you certainly have heard of him, was one of those who fasted the 10 days, because it is mentioned in our heritage books of Islam, all those books that we hear about, that al-Hasan al-Basri, Ibn Sirin and Qatada and all these are celebrity sheikhs they are big shot sheikhs these scholars so when you hear this Al-Hasan al-Basri Ibn Sirin Qatada what they say you want to pay attention to you see our problem these days is that when the Prophet Muhammad came with the Quran and Quraysh was asked to follow the Quran, when everybody else was followed to follow, was commanded to follow the Quran, life was easy. We have one messenger and 
we follow the Quran, life is easy. But after he died, we actually have to follow the Quran. We have to follow Bukhari, Muslim, Ibn Dawud, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah. We have to follow uh, Al-Bazzar. We have to follow Ibn Sirin, Qatada. We have to follow Al-Hasan al-Basri. We have to come, follow the 124,000 of the companions. That's it. We have to follow, to follow all these gazillion humans. And we are not following the one thing Allah commands us to follow the Quran, as you shall see in this talk. So they tell you Al Hassan al Basri, Ibn Sirin, Qatada, they used to fast the 10 days. And what they are also telling you is that since these big shots have done it, well, guess what? You should also do it. And again, for spending the night in Salat and all these things, they report a hadith brought by Al Bayhaqi. And this hadith is also authenticated by Al Albani when they say that when the 10 days arrived, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas was one of the big people to worship Allah, so much so that he would exert himself very hard and push himself in worship in a manner that was extremely hard for anyone to copy him. You see, Allah commands us to follow Al-Quran, number one, and the application of the messenger in his time, but now that he's dead, we are only left with the Quran, but Al-Albani and the other people, they add other people to the, to the whole menu of what we should be following, and that's why we today, Muslims, no matter how much we do, it never is enough. Anyhow, as for increasing the mentioning of Allah's name, that's what they call the dhikr of Allah, they always bring in an ayah from Al-Quran where Allah, they tell you that Allah says, وَيَذْكُرُ اسْمُ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْلُمَاتٍ And that they should utter and mention and remember the name of Allah on those known days. And this is in Surah Al-Hajj, that's Surah number 22, ayah number 28. They tell you this is the evidence that we Muslims should increase the mentioning of Allah's name and making dhikr in those days because they say those known days they refer to the 10 days of the hijjah so much so that Ibn Kathir in his book of tafsir or the explanation of the Quran if you will says that Abdullah Ibn Abbas who is one of the narrators of the hadith where he says that the known days are the 10 days of the hijjah i.e. the known what Allah is referring to as the noun days those days that are known by people are the 10 days of the hijjah and what Ibn Kathir mentioned here became a fact so much so that nobody ever question that those 10 days uh, are something else. It is taken without any question that the 10 days are the 10 days of the Hijjah and that the Ayah 28 of, from the Surah 22, al hajj means the 10 first days of the Hijjah. They, of course, all this but I'll get back to this later on, okay? Then they use another argument in Al-Quran, in Surah Al-Fajr, that is Surah number 89, when Allah says, وَالْفَجْرْ وَلَيَالِ الْعَشْرْ by the Fajr, and that is the break of the day uh, when you see the light uh, breaking away from the darkness. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَيَالٍ عَشْرٍ And by the ten nights. So they say that Allah is referring to the first ten days of the Hijjah in this surah. Mind you, this has absolutely nothing to do with the first ten days of the Hijjah. But as I said, Muslims these days, we are people who consume information. We don't ask questions. If you go and you attend and they talk and he says uh, uh, he recites this ayah and he tells you that those 10 nights are the first 10 days of the hijjah, people will accept them without any questioning whatsoever. Now these are the arguments that they use. So as you can see through these uh, arguments that the great deeds are really in order that we must uh, follow and do and do and do, right? However, there is one hadith that has muddied this uh, virtue story that we have about the 10 days and doing good in these 10 days. And this hadith doesn't work at all. And if scholars could uh, hide it, they would. And believed or not, they do hide it. it. You have to know what's in Al-Bukhari, Muslim, all these things, so that when they tell you something, you go, hang on, I've read elsewhere, and I know that hadith says that. If you don't know that piece of information, you will not know it. The hadith says like this, and the hadith is reported by Aisha, our mother Aisha, one of the wives of the Messenger, where she says, 
أن النبي لم يصوم العشر. That the messenger of Allah did not observe fast in the ten days of the Hijjah. Now this and this hadith is by Muslim and Ibn Majah, so it's very authentic hadith. So this makes the puts the Prophet Muhammad in a very awkward situation where he tells us to do good and he doesn't do it himself because if he tells us that all deeds are greatly seen by Allah, greatly rewarded, and that Allah loves to be worshipped in those days with all kinds of good deeds and then he himself doesn't fast then he, we have a problem he says that what he doesn't do and Allah has warned and threatened and has promised a huge punishment to those people who say that which they do not do in Ibn Majah's version it adds another layer of information a very important layer where our mother Aisha is reported to have said that Rasulullah sallallahu she said ma ra'aytu Rasulullah sam al-ashr qat i never ever saw the messenger of Allah fasting the first 10 days of the hijjah never ever my mother never ever so as you can see this is a huge problem but there is another hadith there comes now the ping pong game between the hadith in Ibn Abu Dawood or Abu Dawood and this hadith is reported by another wife uh, of the messenger and this wife is Hafsa now mind you in the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu Aisha is the leader of a clan half and Hafsa is the uh, is the leader of another clan Aisha and Hafsa never got on together and there was a huge disagreement battle between them but this is a story for another day here Hafsa said كان رسول الله يصوم تسعة ذي الحجة the messenger of Allah used to fast the nine days of ذي الحجة and this has created a lot of problem for the scholars because these two hadiths are very contradictory to each other and the scholars have gone to some you, you, you would fall on your back and laugh till, till you cry of some of the explanation they made all trying to get away from the contradiction between these two hadiths. So the question is, why for centuries and until now, Muslims still think that the 10 days are big shots and that they have virtues and the rewards are multiplied and, and why? Well, if any Muslim would take a minute just to stop and study the arguments given to highlight the virtues and importance of the first 10 days of the Hijjah, these people will quickly find that those arguments do not stand their ground. Because neither Allah in the Quran explicitly said that the 10 days hold a special value, a special virtue, nor the messenger in the practice of the Quran ever did do something like that okay nothing at all so where do all these 10 days why is it the those 10 days with all what you know that they tell you virtues and why am i saying this and many other people are saying that the 10 days have absolutely no virtues whatsoever well let's start with this first thing first as far as we are concerned the only thing that holds weight in this life is what's in the Quran on judgment day when we go back to Allah the only thing that Allah is gonna ask me what I didn't do is what is in the Quran anything else is out of question Allah is not gonna ask you why you didn't practice what's in Bukhari and Muslim or the books of Hadith or what the companions have said or what uh, he's not gonna ask you that on judgment day he will tell you Alam takun ayat tutla alayk. weren't my ayat i.e. the teaching whatever Allah says in the Quran were recited upon you it's either you say yes or you say no there is no third thing in between it's either yes or no so then if you say yes then Allah is going to tell you why you did that or why you didn't do that so Allah never ever mentioned anything about these first 10 days in the Quran now here is why why Allah did it and why the messenger would never ever say a word about those first 10 days and why the whole thing about the first 10 days was done for a specific agenda that I will talk about uh, a bit later on. Allah says in the Quran, 
or as far as Allah is concerned, Hajj doesn't take place in five days as is the uh, as is today. You see, if you want to go to Hajj, all you gotta do is go before the Hijjah, and then you go to Saudi Arabia today, and uh, then wait until uh, Hajj begins, and then for five days you observe Hajj, and then you get back home, and that's done. Allah's Hajj is completely different than what we practice today. And this is a huge example how we Muslims today deliberately ignore and deliberately reject and deliberately put our fingers in our ears for, from what Allah commands us to do. Allah says in the Quran that Hajj in the sight of Allah is not five days, but Hajj takes place in, 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 in months, not days. Let me explain. Allah says, Al Hajj ashhurun ma'lumat. Hajj is to be done in well-known months. So when Allah says, Ashhur al-Ma'lumat, Allah knows what months are, and the people who were listening to Allah knew exactly what Allah was referring to. And then Allah adds, فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجْ So whomsoever intends to perform Hajj in any of these months, Okay, فَلَا رَفَثْ No sexual interaction in Hajj, with your wife of course. وَلَا فُسُوخْ And no committing of sins. وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجْ And no dispute in the Hajj. Basically what Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, this Surah number 2, and the Ayah 197 is that Al-Hajj takes place in a few months, whoever has decided to go Hajj, once you arrive to Hajj, you don't have no more sex with your wife, no more disobedience, no more sins, and no more, and you really shouldn't sin in there and should not get into dispute at all. So therefore, Hajj takes place in four months, as Allah says, not five days. And I will explain a little bit, okay? The first of these four months is Dhul Hijjah. And then Muharram, Safar, and Rabi' al-Awwal. What Allah tells us is this. The period within which Hajj exists is four months. And for us, when we go to Hajj and we perform Hajj, it takes five days, six days, seven days. As long as you perform your act within these four months, that is Hajj. So if you go to in Dhul Hajj, for example, let me give you an example. Yeah? We bunch of uh, ten people. And I... And my wife decide to go to Hajj in Dhul Hijjah. We do Hajj, we decide to go there. We arrive to Saudi Arabia on the 16th of Dhul Hijjah. And as soon as we arrive, we start our Hajj. There is no, you see, Hajj, you don't wait for a beginning. The Hajj from the first of Dhul Hijjah until the last day of Rabi'ul al Awwal, all within that gap is Hajj. So if you arrive the 16th, the 17th, the 19th, the 20th, the 22nd, the 23rd, it doesn't matter when you arrive. You arrive within those months, you perform your Hajj, and then you slaughter your animal and you go back home. And imagine this, people from different parts of the earth going and perform Hajj within the four months, we won't be crowded. There is nothing of that thing there, okay? So again, Hajj takes place from the Hijjah, that's the beginning, and then Muharram, we also do Hajj, Safar, we do Hajj, and Rabi' al-Awwal, it's again Hajj. But what has happened? Why have we lost all this? Why it is that these days Hajj has only become in the first month of the Hijjah? And that's that. I'm not going to bother you with a lot of things, okay? But let me tell you this. Ibn Kathir in his book of Tafsir, and what I'm telling you here is out there in the books of Tafsir, it's out there in the books of scholars, but it's those sheikhs of our times that hide the truth for, uh, from us for various reasons, and I will tell you uh, what's that. 
Our, there are some scholars, for example, in the Maliki school of thought, the Hanafi school of thought, and also in the uh, Hanbali school of thought that is followed by Saudi Arabia. Is Haq ibn Rahawi, a Nahai, a Thawri, a Laith ibn Sa'd. I'm sorry, I'm saying these names just in case someone of knowledge or a Salafi or whoever listens to my talks, they can go back to what I'm saying and they know that I'm not just making up the ideas out of my own brain. Here's what Ibn Kathir says in the translation. Some scholars say, that ihram for the purpose of hajj can be done at any time during the year. Meaning, if you intend, for example, yeah, because of that time there, you see, for them to go to perform hajj, it's not like a six hours flight and you are in Saudi Arabia. To them back in time, let's say someone wants to set on a journey from Morocco to Saudi Arabia. People would go nine months, ten months before that period of hajj to perform hajj. So if you set off from your home seven months before the beginning of hajj, scholars said that your ihram, your journey for hajj starts seven months ahead of time. Subhanallah. That's why they say that ihram for the purpose of hajj can be done at any time during the year. And this is, as I said, is the opinion of Malik, Abu Hanifa, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Ishaq ibn Rahawai, uh, Al-Nakhai, Al-Thawri, Al-Layth ibn Sa'd, and many others. Al-Shafi'i, Ali, Rahmatullah, one of the scholars, he goes, no, 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 no. Hajj is, isn't valid except in the months of Hajj. And he used Allah's ayah that Al-Hajj is, if Ashram Ma'lumat, takes place in well-known months. And Ibn Kathir further on said, it is not of anyone to perform Hajj except in the months of Hajj. And this is the argument or the opinion of the Shafi school of thought. Okay, bear this in mind because these are very important and what we are practicing today is not what is in the Quran and it is not in what the, the scholars of before have said but rather a completely different uh, thing altogether. Al-Bukhari in his Sahih, in his books of Hadith, mentions in his collection again of uh, his Hadith that uh, of Abdullah ibn Umar, again he said, the months of Hajj are Shawwal, Dhul Qa'da, and the 10 days of the Hijjah. So Abdullah ibn Umar says that actually for him, the months of Hajj are Shawwal as soon as Ramadan comes out. The months of Hajj starts and then Dhul Qa'da until the first 10 days of the Hijjah then ends of it. But the problem with this argument is that Allah has said four months in the Quran. So why is Abdullah ibn Umar one of the great companions, son of Abdullah uh, of uh, Umar ibn Khattab? ends up with such uh, understanding, we will never ever know. The question to ask from all this is this. Why is it then squeezing millions of people in a small place at the same time, for example, make three million people as we are today on earth struggle to move around in a very hot, scorching weather and make all those people go to Arafat, three millions on Arafat, three millions in Mina, three millions in Tawaf, and they all do the same thing. And Mecca cannot carry the load of all these millions, and then we get the human stampede and murders and people squashed and squeezed against walls and asphyxiation. And I personally have performed Hajj, and it rained that year, and because of the huge amount of people, I nearly died. I literally uh, was almost asphyxiated. I started punching people around me because I wanted so much air for my life. And I started beating people. My wife was with me. So I was concerned about myself and about my wife back then. So as you can see, all these humans that have died because of all this miscalculation, all this is a vile crime against Muslims, so much so that the entire world looks at Muslims Muslims, how you perform Hajj and they feel sorry for us? Is this Islam? Is this even the people? You see, there are 1.2 billion people that go, uh, Christians, uh, Catholics, and they all go to the Vatican. We never hear a human stampede in the Vatican. Never ever. Uh, how come there are?
are far more uh, organized than what we are. And because of the picture we give, the entire world looks at Muslims as complete losers. If that is pilgrimage and people go die and the way Saudis run the place is a complete loss of case, then guess what? How do we expect people to embrace Islam? But anyhow, so why did our scholars disagree about the Hajj months? They are clear. See, when Allah says in the Quran, Al Hajj Ashurun Ma'lumat. And this is yet another mystery. Because you see, when Allah revealed the Quran, He used an expression that denote that the people present at that time knew exactly what Allah meant. You see, when Allah says, Al Hajj Ashurun Ma'lumat, Hajj is to be done in well known months, the Arabs of that time they exactly knew what Allah was talking about. They knew which, month, which months He referred to. The Messenger of Allah knew exactly what Allah meant and which months He was talking about. The companions they knew which months were. Allah was talking about, and they ne nobody ever went to the measure and you go to message of Allah, excuse me, uh, who, what month does Allah actually uh, refer to? Which month should we do? None ever, not Quraysh, not the companions, nobody ever had any issue about those months. But you see, what happened? Why have we today? We don't know. Well, not we don't know. We know which months uh, they are because Allah indirectly. See, Allah knew what humanity would play up with. So Allah, in case of a humanity doing certain here and there, not so much good, what he did, he gave us some guidance so that you and I, we study the Quran and we can, alhamdulillah, get to the truth, to the bottom of it. If he didn't do that, we actually would be just completely lost without his teachings. All these months were well known at that time. The Arabs, remember, the Arabs used to go make pilgrimage in uh, Quraysh, and this is before the coming of Islam. The Arabs used to have those months and they can't perform Hajj in Mecca. Quraysh knew exactly what months of pilgrimage of Hajj, the Arabs would come and they would prepare business and they would so so the Arabs, those who lived in Mecca, they knew the months of Hajj. The pilgrims, the people who are in the Arabian Peninsula, they also exactly knew when to go to uh, to Mecca. Everybody knew. But you don't know. Nobody knows of the Muslim world unless and until you are told or you research that. So what has happened? Well, my dear sisters and my brothers, Hajj time and its rituals and the Salat times and its rituals were all well known from the time of Ibrahim That's why we don't need no hadith or in the Quran or to tell us how many rak'at should we pray. Because Allah knew and he saw it how it was transmitted from Ibrahim And same thing for Hajj. And this is what happened. The Arabs are known for being the people who don't uphold any promises or treaties. Even the religious ones. Check them out in our times these days. Look, for example, right now in the Gulf. Look at how Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates are against Qatar. Why? Because if one of them doesn't follow a thing, they, are easily, they will easily turn against the other one. Uh, now they, they fight uh, Yemen, they assassinate uh, Yemenis and killing Yemenis and all that kind of stuff. Do they respect the four months, the sacred months where Allah has forbidden the Quran any fights and any killings? Who cares? Nobody. Do the scholars of Saudi Arabia talk about uh, the prohibition of fighting in the four months? They don't care. Well, as you can see, look, let me tell you something, my dear brothers and my sisters. Never ever trust in our history or any other history that has elapsed, especially in telling you events that took place. Do you know why? Because how can we trust in the history that has been written thousands or hundreds of years ago when today right in front of our eyes events are being played with? Subhanallah. 
scholars and sheikhs and people nowadays they are bringing criminalize anyone who doesn't support what uh, America wants to do with Palestine is considered as a terrorist is considered as an outlaw the crown prince of Saudi Arabia Mohammed ibn Salman the way he is treating both his own sheikh and the Muslims all around and how he he is ready to sell everything in his power to sit to become the king and for that uh, the, uh, the, the Jews they know this and they taking very good advantage of his weakness America if, if Trump wants billions all you have to do is tell Mohammed ibn Salman give me 400 billion or I will not protect you and you will lose the access to the throne and the crown prince will pay that's how history and then in the books of history and I hear them speak on YouTube and things like that when they bring these Saudi analysts and experts Wallahi, you hear them speak certain things about the crown prince you think that they are talking about a messenger that they're talking about Ibrahim or Nuh or Prophet or they're talking about someone out of space they say certain things and, and I, I find myself cursing them and I always tell them curse you you're liars curse you you're liars okay so so the Arabs are the last people on earth to ever respect their promises or their treaties, even the most religious of one, they are not good at keeping them. Okay? So this is one thing. So when Allah sent his messenger with the Quran, he sent the messenger, the Quran, to a bunch of humans. And those humans, I'm talking about the Arabs, who knew nothing about discipline or respect. The Arabs at that time were extremely, and they still are today, they great at betrayals and deceptions and treacheries and all this is what Allah has rebuked, what Allah rejects, what Allah doesn't accept. And he told them this in Al-Quran and Allah told us about the Arabs of that time and this kind of particular humans, the Arabs, Allah doesn't hold them high in his, eye, uh, in his uh, views. Okay, so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared at the time when the messenger about the life, the end of his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Allah declared those sacred months that Quraysh knew that they shouldn't fight, the Arabs knew which month they were not allowed to fight, but they kept changing them here and there, and Allah has cursed them for doing that. So those sacred months that Allah enforced so that people would be safe to perform Hajj, these four months are the months for Hajj. The Arabs played with these months and their position in the calendar. When the messenger was alive, this vile practice stopped and didn't get back to life till after the assassination of Omar. When Uthman came and the turmoils started, at the time of Uthman, things started moving a little bit to the dangerous and where the Arabs were going back to how they were before the coming of Islam. When Ali was assassinated and murdered and Muawiyah came to power, good morning problems and good morning trouble. You see, I can tell you stories about how Hajj was just like Saudi Arabia today. Saudi Arabia today in front of everybody uses Hajj. If someone is pro Qatar, you'll never see Hajj. Even Qatari themselves, they're not allowed to go to Hajj. If people who are pro Saudi, like assassination, like the, those, uh, this uh, tyrant, uh, Sisi of Egypt, he goes to uh, Mecca to perform Umrah or Hajj, this, uh, the government opens uh, the doors of Kaaba, they, they empty the whole, uh, they don't care, they would empty the whole Hajj for a Sisi to perform Hajj. No problem with that. That's how always, that's how politics has always been. So you see, the, well, at the time of Muawiyah, that's where problems, and I will just tell, tell you a small version of it. At that time, back in time, the Arabs or the Muslims used to use Hajj for, politi for big meetings. For example, Omar ibn al-Khattab used to have his AGM, the annual general meeting, with all his governors, with all the people that worked for him, i.e. the government, you know, deputies, ambassadors, and all that kind of stuff. Guess, he used to do it in Hajj time. He would go to Mecca and meet them all. They would all meet up there. So Hajj was the time where all different people would meet up there. 
And later on, when people were against Muawiyah for his evil doings, and by the way, the Salafis, they keep pushing Muawiyah as he's the cousin of uh, uh, Khal al-Mu'minin, he's the maternal cousin of the believer, this is absolutely a lie. And that he used to write uh, the revelation, absolutely a lie. And all that, why all these things? To shine his clothes and make him seem a good person right in front of everybody. It is from Muawiyah that we started de derailing. We lost the track of the good Islam that Allah sent us. The first, and the, the first one to have started all that evil mission is Muawiyah, son of Abu Sufyan. Uh, these days when I preach like this and I talk like this, I get a lot of people accusing me of being Shia and things like that. I tell them, like, I am now Shia and I don't, uh, subhanAllah al-haq. But you see, well, as soon as you open your mouth to say something that is truthful, you are attacked and made to seem like you are Shia and things like that. But anyway, let's go back to this. The sacred months in which Hajj exists, Muawiyah, uh, could not take the heat of Muslims having the opportunity to meet in 120 days and a revolt plan and plot against him and things like that. And guess what? Throughout the tyrant uh, dynasty of the Banu Umayyah within the hundred years, slowly by slowly, Banu Umayyah started rejecting the four months concept and narrowing Hajj, bring it down, 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 down until it ended up in those five days that we have them today. The curse want to have started this are Banu Umayyah, starting for Muawiyah, the assassin, uh, the son of Abu Sufyan, the first king to, uh, to have ruled the Muslims with the iron fist and it is him who changed the course of Islam and as I told you before it was Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan who, who created the first ministry of Islamic affairs and he was the one to corrupt the sheikhs to make them preach his arguments okay but anyhow so when these scholars were faced with the defining of what the Hajj months were they literally had no clue and this happened on the third century when our Islam the one that we have today in front of us and in between us was designed and Muslims at that time or the scholars of that time because they were a minority who could read and write and they thought of themselves as big shots well I sometimes when I do my research and things like that I really wonder these people had no clue what the Quran was on about and, and I wonder if they really were scholars uh, in this one I want to add another something that happened in the third century and that thing was extremely dangerous it is a business that flourished you see when Muslims uh, conquered so many lands and, and that is uh, you see we call them like the conquest the, the Muslim conquests we did not there was no Muslim conquest and there was no and, and we uh, see and we used to think like oh we we went and opened those lands to, to spread the religion of Allah. Allah never told us to take the sword and take Islam to people. You embrace Islam, I kill you. But that's what exactly we did. And that's why people today, they say Islam was spread by the sword. And we say, no, 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 no. Islam was spread by the merchants and business people. Well, that was one country in the Far East. But the rest of the world, it was the sword. And I tell you, it was the sword. And it's in our books of history. And that's why we, if you go in our books of fiqh, they will tell you this. We would send, let's say, okay, the army goes to Syria before, uh, or before, go, let's go North Africa. The armies, like Banu uh, Umayyah did, they would send the army to Africa. The army comes to, say, Tunisia. They are on the, uh, on the verge of the, the frontiers of Tunisia. Then what happens is the Muslim army would send a delegation, a group of people that go and speak to that king. They arrive there, good morning, good morning, yes, what do you want, sirs? Okay, now, and the army, the Muslim army, tell this kind of guy, they tell him, we came to spread Islam in your land. And the guy say, okay. Now imagine a whole Islam you're going to explain to a king in one setting. What are you going to tell them? No matter what people believe in, you tell them, well, Islam says that God is one, the Quran, and you have to believe in Muhammad. And because we were like the United States of America, we had this uh, superpower for people that we were, we would not talk to people in a very compromising way. It was more of, you got to believe in this, you got to believe in this, you got to believe in that. Now, me being a king, I will tell them, well, you know what? I actually, we're happy 
in what we believe in, so please, thank you very much. We don't want your religion. But this comes the surprise, then we will tell them, well, then, if you don't want us, if you don't want us to give dawah, you need to pay us a tax for protecting you. Now I'm going to tell them, hang on, and why do I need you to protect me? I'm happy, you know, leave me alone. I don't want your religion, and I don't want your protection. And then comes the third think or the sun like the, the atomic bomb we tell these people then it is the war between us and you and you have three days to think it over and guess what most of our battles took place like that you, you let us do islam if not you pay taxes if not we fight you and then when we fight and enter and take the girls and we take all that kind of stuff then comes oh we, we preach islam and things like that well Allah, we did wrong we did wrong we did wrong and it's in our books of history and the world knows it but it, the only ones who refuse to know it is us and we, even when we say it we change the truth but what can we say anyhow so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says al-hajju ashwar al-ma'lumat and as I said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sure and he said that the Hajj takes place in well-known months and these months have become in our times or in our books and the scholars argued and they became unknown now there is an issue of global versus local that we need to understand when Allah states in the Quran that the Hajj takes place in months what he meant was the entire Hajj for example your Salat takes five minutes yeah so the whole duration of your Salat takes five minutes now the whole duration of what Hajj is, is four months. You as an individual, when you go perform Hajj, you're free to go and perform Hajj any days within these four months. Okay, you slaughter your animal, you do your Arafah, and you go. Arafah is not the ninth day of Hajj. It's, this is a, one of the huge lies. Arafah is any day when you go perform, let's say you go perform your Hajj now, the fifth day from now is your Arafah day. If you come, if uh, for example you come today, yeah? if, someone, if your sister joins you next day and she starts her Hajj a day after you, then her Arafah becomes a day after you and she slaughters her animal after you. And Hajj is like that, it's when you come, you do your Hajj, or when you decide to start your Hajj, then you perform your Arafah and when you come home, Arafah was never ever meant to be on a set day. Who did that? It was politics. Politics, my dear sisters and my brothers, is what has messed up our Islam. So what are the months of Hajj? I'm going to tell you now. We're going to go quickly through the Quran. Oh, yeah, Allah, 41 minutes. But anyhow, we're going to go quick through this one, okay? So to figure out these months uh, that the Arabs knew exactly, that Quraysh knew, the Arabs knew, everybody knew, here is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about them. In Surah At-Tawbah, that is Surah number 9, Allah says in this, Bara'atun min Allah, this is so at that Hajj and this is in the year 10 and uh, before few days before the death of Rasulullah when he went there Rasulullah uh, sorry year 9 when Rasulullah sent Ali and uh, Allah revealed this Quran that Allah is actually putting any agreement between Allah through his messenger, with all the other pagans and polities and things like that, to an end. Any agreement, any treaty, anything has come to an end, as Allah is telling them right now. So Allah says, Bara'atun min Allahi wa Rasulih. This is a declaration of discharge from all obligation, i.e., any kinds of treaties that were in force, Allah has come and says it's, they come to an end. Why did Allah say Allah? Because he is the supreme commander. And he mentioned his messenger because Allah was talking to a specific set of people and Muhammad being the messenger of Allah at that time was the executioner. He was the guy who executed Allah's wishes. And then Allah says to those with whom you had made treaties amongst the politicians this ayah used by Daesh and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab to assassinate people around the world was, used, was for a specific set of people that have existed and it 
is not for us. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so the, what, the, this declaration of discharge is the body of the message, right? And now comes the length of the validity of this message, of this declaration, where Allah speaks about the four months. So Allah says to them, فَسِيحُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ You may go freely on the land, on earth, for four months. And then Allah tells them, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ غَيْرُ مُعْجِزِ اللَّهِ But no, you politicists, you people who have chosen to stay on the war side, that know very well that you will not be able to make it difficult to Allah to take his revenge from you through his messenger, the executioner, okay? And then Allah says, وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْزِي الْكَافِرِينَ And certainly it is Allah, because he is the doer, and he is the high commander who will disgrace and bring disgrace upon those who cover the truth. Now this is the message and the length of the message is four months. And when does the start of this message start? Ya Allah, when does the start date start? Then Allah says, وَآذَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ This is a public proclamation by Allah again as the supreme commander and his messenger as the executioner to all the people on the day of the great pilgrimage and that was the beginning of the hijjah Okay, the beginning of the month of the Hajjah, that year there, that Allah is free from all obligation to those who associate others with Allah and His divinity. That's it. Allah here is taking His hands off of any treaty, starting from the beginning of the Hajjah. And the expiry date, Ya Allah, I guess, فَإِذَا انْسَلَخَ الْأَشْهُرُ الْحُرُمْ فَاقْتُلُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُمْ Then when the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them because they were in a state of war back then Allah never talked about us or anyone uh, after that period but politics back in time used this ayat to wrongly kill people now how do we know it's four months well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said فَسِحُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرَ so rove go freely in the air, land for four months in another Ayah in the same surah number nine, Allah says, "In the عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَى عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ." Indeed, the number of months in the sight of Allah with Allah is twelve months and the lunar months, and of those months, four are decreed as sacred and it is in those four months that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us not to transgress against ourselves as such the hajj performance gap is within the four months starting from the hijjah and then we count the next month till the fourth month comes in and which in our case here is this way the hijjah is the beginning of hajj muharram is the second month in which we can perform hajj safar is the third month in which we perform Hajj, Rabi al Awwal is the fourth month and the last month we can perform Hajj. This is why in the ayah in Al Quran Allah uh, says, فَمَن تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ أَوْ تَأَخَّرَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ Whoever does his Hajj two, uh, his hajj two days before or two days later, فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ There is no problem with it. Why did Allah say this? Because Allah is telling us if you start your Hajj two days before the beginning of the months of Hajj, or two days after they have elapsed, then there is no problem, Allah will accept that from you. So it's four months, two days before, and two days after that. My dear sisters and my brothers, look at politics and what they do today, and this is extremely strange, because the Saudi government today always and always have, after Hajj has, the five days of Hajj have elapsed, what they do, they close the Umrah uh, visas for three months after Hajj. Basically what they do, the Hajj is the beginning, and the other three months where Hajj can still be performed, Saudi Arabia closes the doors, not even give a visa to go and perform Umrah. If this is not an example how the Quran is thrown against the wall, I really don't know what that is. And as if those sheikhs of Saudi Arabia, those companions, those people that have uh, escaped history, and Ibn Taymiyyah, and the companions are amongst us, as if this sheikh 
sheikhs, these, these people that have sold their lives for, for nothing, as if they didn't know what Allah said in the Quran. But that shows you how politics play and how the sheikhs of our Sunni world, are exactly the Shia as well, how our scholars have no respect for the religion of Allah and they actually make a living with Islam. But anyhow, now to conclude my talk here, I want to say this, my decision, I'm a it is impossible for the first 10 days to have any virtue or any value or any special about them for the following reason. Number one, Hajj is performed within four sacred months. And as such, if any virtues was to be given to anything, it should have been given to the four months equally. This is why Allah says in within those four sacred months, do not transgress against yourselves. The command is clear. Allah doesn't need for 10 days of the four months. And I'll tell you later on, well, I'll tell you right now, uh, anyhow, the reason why they made the 10 days of the Hijjah special, the reward of these things, is that Muslim do not think of Hajj as four months, but only five days. Because once you hear that the 10 days of the Hijjah are highly regarded reward, things like that, you would automatically think that Hajjah is only 10 days. Hajj is not 10 days. Hajj is a hundred, staggering 120 days, give or take a couple of days. That's it. Point number two, it is impossible that the messenger of Allah would say such an evil, such a lie out of his own head without it being a revelation from Allah. And since Hajj is four months, it is impossible that Muhammad would say that the first ten days of the Hijjah are the most beloved to Allah. This is a lie. Otherwise, Hajj is not performed in four months. In, in months, it's performed in days. And this is impossible. Number three, all the man-made hadith and all this marketing machine is nothing else but to keep Muslims blind from what the government of the past have done. And all the alterations, manipulation, and all the fabrication, and all the stupidity alterations that they have made to the book of Allah and to Islam. You see, when you think that the best 10 days are those of the Hijjah, you never ever think of all the calamity that the governments of before have done. But Hajj is to be done in four months. How come 10 days of these four months are the most beloved? Allah, they make Allah here easily as a liar, astaghfirullah. Claiming that the first 10 days, my dear sisters and my brothers, hold a special virtue, makes a Muslim not believe nor accept it, not even be aware that Hajj is within four months. And by doing that, you classify the Quran as a liar. You read this Quran uh, in uh, Tarawih, and this is what makes the situation worse. People read, they go to Tarawih, and they all are, uh, they want to perform Tarawih, and guess what? And you see, they read this, that, that Hajj is performed in months, and they want to get the rewards, the one letter for ten rewards, and still, like idiots, they never pay attention that Hajj is within months. And that is the power of the brainwash. My dear sisters, Islam is built on the hadith, and those hadith do not, do not belong to Allah. The hadith is nothing else but a conjecture made by humans for the sole purpose and agenda to attack Islam. As I said earlier on, in the third century, the uh, business flourished. That business is business of al warraqun al warraqun at that time, are in our days today, are the printers. You see, when you, if you want to print a book, you write a book and then you take it to a printer and they print 10,000 of it and that's it. Exactly in the third century when the Muslims started becoming more uh, educated and they wrote books and all the kind of stuff, they needed people to duplicate their books. And at that time here, all kinds of people from all kinds of the world, the Arabs at that time, they were not good at writing. So people from Persia, Roman, and all kinds of people, Europe, all kinds of people migrated to Baghdad. They opened businesses, and this is where the danger came. You are a scholar, and you've written a book. Now, for me as a scholar to get a copy of your book, I would come to you, borrow your book, and then what I do, I take it to the warraqun, the printers at that time, there, and it was handwritten. Their religion, where they came from, was not important. What was important was writing of the book. So me, 
let's say I am one of those people, the handwriter, the hand copier, right? But I am a person who doesn't like, let's say I'm Shia, right? Let's say I'm that. And uh, I don't like what you have written. Guess what? I take liberty of altering and changing what you have written. And this has happened to a book, the Quran. Our Quran has tried, people have tried to play with the text with them. And in one of the stories, one person, I'm not going to say his religion here, uh, whether he embraced Islam because he had played with the text of the Quran, hoping to sell different copies, of falsified copies of the Quran, but not, when people read them, they returned them to him, and then he said that people were memorizing the Quran, and he embraced Islam for that. But other books, even today, when a book gets uh, uh, edited or they want to duplicate, oh, there are always some PhD doctors, and they always tell you that they have different versions of the same book. Different, and then at times they can't have the right. To, who is the author who has written this or that book? Reason is the printers of that time there. They used to manipulate the text of the books. So many stories: Al Bukhari, Muslim, and all these people were manipulated by those authored and that's why we have so many calamities in these books in our days. But you know, believing that Hajj is only uh, five days, i.e. of Dhul Hijjah, and believing that the first ten days hold special values is a direct accusation of Allah to have him betraying and misguided us. Because in the Quran he says, Hajj takes place in months, and then he goes around and tells him, no, 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 you know what? The first 10 days are more, uh, I reward more for these 10 days and things like that. Well, it doesn't make a sense at all. Now, the other side and the scarier side now. <sighs> Each year, my dear sisters and my brothers, Muslims around the world celebrate two Eids. We told that in Islam we only have two Eids, and they made every other celebration as haram, right? We only have Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Fitr comes for after Ramadan with all the promises that they have, and then there is the other Eid of Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha is done at the 10th of the day of the Hijjah and that is, uh, they slaughter uh, in Mecca and the entire Muslim world also sl uh, slaughters in harmony with these people, okay? But why do we slaughter this? Uh, why do we slaughter? The Quran says for different reasons and I encourage you to go on my YouTube and look for Hajj, uh, the, the, the meaning, the absence of the meaning and you understand, I've explained there why we perform Hajj and it is not because of what Ibrahim has done. But Eid al-Adha, when we slaughter the animal, it is done with that in spirit. Well, the story goes like that. As Allah says in the Quran, that Allah speaks that, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ And when they both had surrounded and agreed to act on what Ibrahim has seen in his vision, and Ibrahim laid his son on his face, and he wanted to slaughter him. And then uh, Ibrahim was called, and somebody called Ibrahim, يَا Ibrahim, لَقَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا You have indeed acted the vision, and كَإِنَّ كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِئَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And we reward the good. Doers. And then Allah says, Inna hadha lahu al -bala -ul -mubin. This is this was truly the revealing test. And I will say this again to you, my dear, my brothers. But I will leave this later on. Why Allah used the revealing? Why did Allah have to put Ibrahim through this test to see if Ibrahim would oblige or not? But um, this will be covered, inshallah, about the, the Allah and the future and the unseen. I'll cover that later on, sure. And then Allah says, Wafadainahu bi and we ransomed the kid with a great sacrifice. This is in as Safad, Surah number 37, from Ayah 103 to 107. This incident is mentioned also in the Torah, the story of Ibrahim wanting to slaughter his kid, and then he was ransomed by an animal. Allah in the Quran did not specify what kind of animal uh, Allah used to ransom uh, the, the kid. But in the Torah and the Bible, the story takes a different uh, stand because the Jews and the Christians believe also in Ibrahim and the slaughtering of the kid, just as we do. Well, as it turned around, our current aren't in agreement. You see, the Jews and Christians, they see it's Isaac, Ishaq, who was the kid to be slaughtered. We Muslims today, we say, who is the kid who was going to be slaughtered? Yeah, you're right. You said Ismail, right? That's it. You said Ismail. But what you don't know of this is that our scholars, 
before. Okay, I'm not talking about uh, since the Jews invaded uh, Palestine. I'm talking before. Our scholars before, like at Tabari said, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, and, and um, Omar ibn al-Khattab uh, said, and few other companions, there was a, oh, there's, there is still a disagreement be between scholars as to which of the two was the kid. Some of them, they say, is Haq, and the other ones said Ismail. Even in Saudi Arabia today, someone called al muhamisi has one day said it on the television, national television, that the slaughter kid was not Ismail but was Ishaq. Of course this is taken very bitterly because of the Jews and Palestine and what uh, and all, but uh, if that was not the case well, th this would not have caused any problem. And today if you say it is Ishaq, they straight away will take it as if you are supporting uh, the Jews. But it's not. This is something that taken place and it happened before. But anyhow, uh, I want to read to you something about the Jews because this will explain to you why we do aid and why the whole shebang is all existing, it's, it's mind boggling. Like everyone else, my dear sisters and my brothers, the Jews celebrate uh, this festival of, uh, of uh, Ibrahim slaughtering Ishaq. But they do it in a very different way. You see, the Jews in their language, they don't have the S sound. The Jews, in, they have, for example, instead of saying salam, they say shalom. Instead of saying Sabbath, which is a Saturday, they say Shabbat. Shabbat is uh, Sabbath. Okay? Now, the Jews have a, uh, a New Year's Day that they celebrate. That New Year's Day is called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, which in Arabic translates to Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, or here like a New Year's Day. Okay? So this is the beginning of that year. Well, the Jewish New Year is the celebration of the anniversary of the creation of Adam. Okay? And also a day of judgment and coronation and the sounding of the shofar. Shofar is, uh, you take a ram's horn and you blow in it. Okay? It's, that's, that's exactly what it is. And why do the Jews carry the, the horn's ram and blow in it and sound in it? Well, as it goes and here is where it all gets in together. The Jews use the horn of the ram as a sign of thankfulness for saving Isaac from the knife of Ibrahim. And they use the ram because in the Torah and the Bible, it is said that Allah had used a ram, had sent a ram to ransom Isaac. We Muslims today, the reason we slaughter a sheep every year is because of this tradition. The Quran never said for us to slaughter a sheep. The Sunnah never ever said to slaughter a sheep. So where did we get all this? Well, pay attention. I want you here to pay attention more than you ever have. Rosh Hashanah or Ras Hashana, or uh, the New Year's Day is one of the two most high and most revealed Jewish religious holidays along with Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, Yom in Arabic is Yom, the day. Kippur is Maghfirah, is the day Allah forgives. And we have the Rosh Hashanah, the, the, the New Year's Day. Rosh Hashanah is a two days celebration. The New Year's Day for them takes a two days celebration. And in these, every New Year's, the Jewish recall the, uh, the story of Ibrahim and Ishaq and they slaughter an animal, they slaughter a sheep, and preferably a ram, preferably a strong, beautiful, long-horned ram. To the more they are closer to the original ram, as much as the Bible, the better they are with Allah, or so their faith goes on. They do this, my dear sisters, uh, on the first of uh, uh, Chiri. Uh, in Arabic, of Chirin. Chirin is the seventh month of Je uh, the religious Jewish calendar and their first uh, civil calendar. And they coincide somewhere between September and October of each day. Oh, sorry, of each year. So in this time, the particular year, what they do is this. They slaughter the animal, they blow the ram, the, the horn, the ram horn, and they tell the story of 
of how uh, Ibrahim nearly sacrificed Isaac. Why does this hold such a huge value in the eyes of the Jews? Isaac is the grandfather of the Jews. Ishaq, after Ishaq, he had Yaqub. Yaqub is Israel. And then Yaqub has his uh, uh, Yusuf and the 12 tribe of Israel come from Jacob. And it is them who went to Egypt. Then Musa was born from uh, one of the 12 children of Yaqub and then he took them out of Egypt into the promised land. So as you can see, if Ishaq was slaughtered, there'd be no Jews and that's pure and simple. So to them, it, it, it holds such a huge existence value. Okay, so during the high holidays, again, the Jews cleanse their soul and they get uh, closer to Allah. And here is the kicker. If anyone does great deals, fasts on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and these two festives, especially Yom Kippur, when you fast the day of Yom Kippur, Allah forgives the sins of the year before for the Jews. Does that, sound, does that remind you of something? You're going to say, Ashura, Arafah, is when we fast Allah. It's exactly the same thing. The Jewish have their festive where Allah forgives. Guess what we did, the Muslims? We invented hadiths. We falsified hadiths to counter the Jewish. Wow, you have Yom Kippur where Allah forgives a year before. Guess what? We have Ashura where Allah forgives the year before and Arafah, the, the year before and the year after. For a Muslim, he never is in a sin. I don't know why the, the heck we are all scared. If on Arafah, Allah forgives the next year and the year before, we are always in credit. And Ashura comes in, we also are the previous year. So we, we actually don't have a sin, right? Wrong. All this is a lie. All this is a lie. There is no such thing you do a deed Allah gives you. What Allah is going to give you is on judgment day. I'm going to keep it simple here. But for the Jews, my dear sisters and my brothers, every year when they slaughter their animal to celebrate, call it this way, their Eid al-Adha, okay? Is they exemplify how Ibrahim was the head, the pinnacle of obedience. And Isaac, in their view, embodies the martyr. And that is in Judaism. Uh, the Jewish, uh, in the Jewish News Syndicate, which is world-renowned, you can go to, on the internet, Jewish News Syndicate, News Syndicate, and you'll read, here's an excerpt from what the Jewish people think about our festival, especially Eid al-Adha, and how they look at them. They say, Eid al-Adha is a theft of a Jewish narrative. Twisting narratives has long been part and parcel of Islamic culture. Further, culture dictates that once a narrative is the culture of the Arabs and Muslims, okay, that's how the Jews, they look at us. They say, once a narrative is promoted, like the slaughter of, you see, the Jews, they say it's Ishaq, we say it's Ismail. And then once we promote something, it can no longer be effectively challenged, nor can it stand peacefully alongside a comparative narrative. You see, if Jewish were living with us, and that has always gone for the last 1400 years, okay, when the Jews were living under us, they could not celebrate that Rosh Hashanah or the, the, the New Year's Day for them and celebrate that Isaac, Isaac was the one who was going to be slaughtered. They could not celebrate that. Why? Because we Muslims would not tolerate that. My dear sisters, these two events, i.e. the first 10 days of the Hijjah and the Eid al-Adha are fake uh, celebrations, including Eid al-Adha. Has Allah commanded us to slaughter only if you are in Hajj. When you are in Hajj, you slaughter. If you're not in Hajj, is life as normal. You don't have to worry about anything else. But the religion of the Hadith has created for us something. Why? Well, here is why. Because we always wanted to harm the Jews. We always wanted to hurt the Jews. We always wanted to be better than the Jews. If they have Yom Kippur, where Allah in the religion forgives the 
previous years, not only did we invent Ashura that Allah forgives the previous year, but we also invented Arafah. When you fast it, you get one year before and one year uh, after. Allah forgives. That doesn't happen. Because as far as Allah is concerned, Arafah could be any day of the 120 days of the four months. So this year, did you, will you fast Arafah and get reward? Absolutely not. Because to Allah, you are not in Hajj. This is for people in Hajj. There is no such thing as you fast. You get the reward of one year before and year after. It doesn't happen. You see, we always wanted to make the Jews be smaller, lower, less than us. That our Islam is better than theirs. And this is the whole problem of what we ended up with. We have created a parallel, competitive religion with the Jewish religion. And until today, it, it, it really is sad. My dear sisters and my brothers, Hajj happens once in, uh, in those four months, whenever you can go Hajj and believe it or not, uh, Saudi Arabia is going to close the Hajj after uh, uh, the gates to, to Umrah after Hajj. But if you could not perform Hajj in the first 10 days of the Hijjah, do not be scared. Wait until if you can go to Saudi Arabia, in, but they won't let you go to Arafah, you see. But if they let you go to Arafah and slaughter, I would go on Rabi' al awwal and perform my Hajj, slaughter my animal and come home and you in the sight of Allah, you have performed Hajj. So from now on, use your mind to challenge anything. The Islam we are following today is a parallel Islam created based on what the Hadith says, what the scholars said, but what Allah said is always always at the far back behind us. Now we understand as to why the, the 10 days are nothing at all and that Eid al-Adha is nothing at all. But we just because the Jews wanted to push Ishaq, well they didn't want to push Ishaq as a matter of fact, they just want to celebrate it. That's their religion but because we are the superpower at that time there, we wanted Muslims to always uh, celebrate that it was Ismail and as a counter against Ishaq that's why we we push this one on people and we made people or they made people slaughter their animal and tell the story of it is Ismail not Ishaq because of the great animosity between uh, Jews and Muslims and this animosity should never ever have taken place but that's politics for you that's the price we're paying and we will carry on paying the price Unless we go back to the Quran. When we do go back to the Quran, the price will terminate. My dear sisters and my brothers, there is no such thing as the first 10 days and their virtues. All this is a huge lie. There is no such thing as Eid al-Adha for us. But for the people that are in Hajj, it is them that slaughter. Don't worry. Don't waste your money. Don't do all that kind of stuff because on Judgment Day... Those scholars that have lied to us will find a very, very, very big surprise. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanif, and I pray to Allah that this has opened your eyes to what's out there. Islam is beautiful, simple, nice, as Allah has said, and it is our scholars, our rulers, that have made it extremely difficult. If tyrants of our uh, world, the Arabs, the tyrants that are ruling us today, love one group of Muslims, they love the Salafists and they love the Sheikhs, because these people are there to keep the past alive. All the lies of the past are alive, and all the beauty of the Quran is hindered and kept away. I pray to Allah to safeguard us, and that's why on Judgment Day, our Prophet Muhammad will stand up with a copy of the Quran in his hand, and will point to his Muslims, and he will say, Ya Rabb, inna qawm ittakhadu hadha al-Quran majura. Ya my Lord, my people, this group of people, the bunch of Muslims that are there, they have undertaken your Quran as abandoned, i.e. all the teachings that you have in the Quran, they deliberately forsake them, they deliberately didn't follow them, please don't be one one of those people. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.